and stand. We're going to read our text together. This is out of John, the 13th chapter, and we're going to read together verses 1 through 17. If that is too long to be standing, uh, feel free to sit. Really, I believe it's the position of your heart that God is uh, concerned about. This morning, we are standing in honor uh, to the Word of God that God actually lifts up above his own name. So, Read with me in John 13, verses 1 to 17. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which was which he was girded. Then he said to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. God bless him. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taking his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed or happy are you if you do them. Father, we pray today that we would experience the happiness and the joy of God because of doing what you have commanded us to do. Thank you for this lesson on humility, this lesson on servitude. Thank you that the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, was willing to bow down and get on one knee to wash dirty feet. Thank you for that spirit. Thank you that he calls for the mind of himself to be also in us. Thank you now. Bless your people in a powerful way. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. You can be seated, folks. Most of you know that we are going through a series of six weeks, a series called Portraits uh, of Jesus, and uh, we are on sermon number two today, the portrait of of his humility. I read a book years ago. Maybe you read it and enjoyed it. It was a book by Ravi Zacharias, and Ravi Zacharias, in his book, Why Jesus, was the title, said some profound things in chapter number 12. I have a couple of copies of it. If you'd like to read it, it will stimulate your thought process 
and do a number on your heart also. But what I'm talking about today reflects a little bit what Ravi Zacharias said in his book. Why Jesus? Why another series on Jesus Christ? Why another message about Jesus Christ? Haven't we heard them all? Well, I think not. And the reason that I choose to have a series on the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing about him and the unsearchable riches of Christ, is inexhaustible. You can never get all that you desire to get concerning the Son of God. Ravi made this statement, and I want to say that this is his quote, we live in a day where people reshape Jesus to suit their prejudices. Whatever you think about Jesus, you will fit it into your own set of circumstances and make it work for you. And then I thought about different people and the reason we're preaching on Jesus because of the perception of people or lack thereof of people concerning Jesus Christ. What about the distorted Jesus that is lifted up? Who in the world is he? Who was he? Well, good man, prophet, priest, kind of an earthly king, but I'm not so sure God, so they distort who the Son of God really was and is. The non-exclusive Jesus is lifted up today, meaning that there are many ways to heaven. So I guess Jesus was a liar when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I guess in the book of Acts, it's also a lie as the inspired word of God when it says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What about the non-crucified Jesus? Well, you know, are we really sure that he was crucified? And what did that all mean? Because many people have died for noble causes. And yet he laid down his life and also had the power to take it again. And Jesus did not want us to confuse this point. So the unrisen Jesus that some lift up made sure there were 500 witnesses at one time made sure that there were accounts from the disciples. Even Jewish historians like Josephus lift up the risen Savior. And if we don't accept that, my preaching is vain, and your faith is in vain, and we are still in our sin, because that sacrifice was to know Avail. How about the non judgmental Jesus? Well, he just loves everyone, and that certainly is true. But one day at the two judgment seats that are listed in the book of Revelation, guess who will be there? Jesus. He will be the one judging all sin. And when he comes again, he will come in quite a different manner than he came the first time, and thank God for the way that he came the first time. The Jesus of 2019 is a deal breaker. You can say God, you can say the man upstairs, but don't you dare say Jesus, some controversy will start when you say the name of Jesus. And yet Philippians 2.10, if we happen to believe the Bible, says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wouldn't it be great to willingly bow that knee, to willingly confess with your tongue who Jesus is and not waiting until you are forced 
to do so. John Bunyan made a statement concerning humility. If you don't know who John Bunyan is, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, if you haven't read that or seen the movie, it'll thrill your heart as you see the pictures and the symbolism and the analogies. John Bunyan said, he that is down, speaking of humility, needs fear, no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. If we seek after humility and a teachable spirit and yield ourselves to God, we're in good standing. God can use us. God can bless us. God can do some interesting things. In our text, there is an interesting progression of events. Satan has already placed it in Judas's heart to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what that tells me and causes me to fear? 33 and a half years, Jesus' public ministry, Judas was right there. He knew of Jesus, but he wasn't in Jesus. You may wonder sometimes why I give an invitation you know, when we're in church, and doesn't he know that the vast majority, if not all, have at least stated that they receive Christ as Savior? The reason I do that is because the Bible says, examine yourself to see if you're of the faith. So that's no one judging you. Examine yourself by what is written in the Word of God. So we find from our text, Jesus knew what was going to happen. He is the one true know-it-all. He knows everything. It's okay when Jesus tells you he knows everything, because he does. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew who was going to do it. He knew how it was going to happen. He knew about Malchus' servant losing his ear and him restoring it. He knew there would be an arrest and a mock trial. He knew everything. He knew he'd be beaten and mocked, and that he would go to a cruel cross and become a curse for every sinner who ever lived, who was living at the time, and all sinners in the future, which takes us in. Jesus Christ knew everything that was going to take place, but he decided to gird himself with a towel. He decided to get a basin, fill it with water, and he decided, with all that on his mind, all that pressure, he still was about the mission. He said to himself, I think I'll wash some feet. Now, if you've ever been in turmoil or you had some adversity in your life or opposition, you're usually thinking of how to dissect and eliminate all that in your life. I need that eradicated. Very seldom do we think about the mission while we're suffering. Jesus was all about us. And because the Spirit of God lives within us, we are to be all about him in reaching out no matter what our circumstances. You know what's interesting, folks, if you're taking notes? The Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, is the only gospel where this washing of the feet is spoken about. And yet, we find that one thing John omits that the other gospel writers write about is the argument that the disciples had concerning who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven as they battled for their turf. Even some moms got involved in that, trying to elevate their sons. And don't take this wrong, but you know how moms can be about their boys, right? in most cases. I know my mom is very protective of me, and uh, she'll sometimes take things wrong even when it wasn't said wrong. What did they say to you? I said, no, mom, that was a good thing. That was a compliment. Oh, okay. But she's on watch, so beware. All right? You're all right for now. Natalie is in Pennsylvania. But uh, be careful. So anyway... 
I want you to notice a few things about this portion of Scripture today. Number one, the Feast of the Passover. We look first at John 13 and verse 1 again. This stuff amazes me, especially with an all-knowing God, Jesus, who knew what would happen to him, who was 100% God, 100% man, had feelings, had emotions, felt physical pain. And when I read these things, I think about all that. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. Passover out of Exodus 12, that last dreaded plague in Egypt as Israel was about to be released from bondage, the firstborn taken by the death angel unless the blood of a lamb was smeared around the door jams of their dwelling place. Here's Jesus, the Passover lamb. Celebrating Passover, talking about these things, talking about the significance in what it meant, and it was him. That ought to grab our hearts, that he's talking, he's loving, he's ministering, he's washing feet, he's talking about servitude, and he knows what's coming. Boy, to love people when you know what's coming that is a sign of being like Jesus Christ. Now, during this Passover feast, this time, he knew. John, the 10th chapter, says several times he came to die. His plan wasn't foiled. He came to die. He came to offer his life a ransom for many. He loved us while we were dead in trespasses and sin. When we come to Jesus... There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are beneath the blood of Christ, who have accepted what he did on the cross for their sake. Isaiah 53 says, God the Father will see the travail of the soul and the heart of Christ and be satisfied. Why did God the Father have that requirement for sin? I don't know but he did, and he knew the only way he could be approached. You know what I find the greatest error in Christianity is, folks? Even born-again believers, they compare themselves with other people. The measuring rod is comparing ourselves with God. What do you do as a sinner when you compare yourself with one who has no sin, with one who's infallible? Who one with one who is perfect. That's where we fall short. And that's why we're told, be perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. God knew the only way for you and I to be perfected would be by the perfect sacrifice, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. You and I didn't do anything special to get ourselves into heaven except to say, I believe, come into my heart, Lord. Right? And repent of that sin, realizing that he died for every sin. He's the propitiation, big word, for our sin. Not for ours only, but for the sin of the whole world. Propitiation, payment. Payment for sin the only price that would be accepted by God the Father. I want to read a couple of verses to you. You can mark it down in your notes. Exodus 12, the same chapter as the Passover lamb and their preparation for the death angel. It said, on the 10th of this month, verse 3, every man shall take for himself, and the wording is important because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen? Amen. So the wording is, he shall take for himself a lamb. According to the house of his father, a lamb. A lamb for a household. 
Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel, this is verse 21, and said to them, pick out and take lambs. So we have a lamb, a lamb, a lamb, and then lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. Isn't it interesting when Jesus Christ broke on the scene and he went to be baptized by John in John 129, Here's John, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. I don't know if he said, and all God's people said amen. I don't know. But as he's baptizing, he suddenly looks and he takes a double take. And he says, oh, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This was different. Not a lamb, not any of the pictures in the Old Testament that portrayed a lamb coming. Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Now I wonder in chapter 13 of John, understand the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of John, it's a starting point, and then there is a division kind of a progression into something else. The first 12 chapters are showing Jesus using every possible means for reaching the lost and getting their attention. And we could go through the stories this morning. How he sought to reach people, how he loved them, how he bent down and rode in the dirt, how he looked up into trees and called people down, how he went to customs tables and called tax collectors, as he talked to prostitutes, as he touched lepers, as he stepped through the infirmed at the pool of Bethesda. He did it all because he loved people. And he wanted to reach them in the first 12 chapters. But in chapter 13, he is more speaking to his own and speaking to his disciples. And I wonder if when the phrase says, his own, and loving them to the end, John 13, 1. I wonder if that could reflect into John 1, 11 when it says he came onto his own, but his own received him not. Ever love somebody who won't receive the good news that you have? But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He loved his people. He reached out to them. He did everything possible to try to break down the barriers and to lift the blindness so that they would know who he was and what he was there to accomplish. Secondly, this morning, humility. Doesn't that have a nice ring to it? Some words are just nasty, like raw word, right? When am I going to let that die? Humility has a nice sound to it. Humility, yet mindful of the consequences. John 13 and verse 2, And supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Hey, this sermon, this lesson is a lesson on humility, but we're going to see much more as we see Jesus have a dialogue with Peter. Don't you always like when Jesus had a dialogue with Peter? You know, Peter's pretty cool. Maybe he didn't get it the first time, but he'd be real quick to rectify the situation in a moment to follow. And I, I just want to take a stutter step again with Peter. Does that break your heart or what? Don't think he was predestined to be the betrayer. Predestination according to foreknowledge. God who is all-knowing. I know some people like to complicate it, but God can look into eternity future and know what decisions we'll make. And he'll know who will come to him and receive him and call them the chosen, the redeemed, the elect. And you can email me if you'd like to debate a little bit about that, but I might be having a snack watching the Red Sox. I don't know. 
How sad, how tragic for someone to be with Jesus, but not to be in Jesus. To take a hit with full knowledge of what was coming and the necessity of it all. But you know what I get excited about? The second coming of Christ. Look how he came. You know, Micah 5, 2 portrays him being born in little Bethlehem. Humility, a baby, fulfilling prophecy. But understand Revelation 19, 6, when he's returning with his saints, it says, on his vesture and thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords, on a white stallion, not a donkey, but a white stallion waging war on all ungodliness. Did he love anybody any less? My gosh, no. But ju judgment, excuse me, does eventually fall. I think of the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 10 says, Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. No one did that better than Jesus. And we are told that it's a wonderful thing when we share in the sufferings of Christ as long as we're sharing in the sufferings for Christ. Not doing something foolish, but suffering because we've done something right and we suffer for it. And that's between you and God. Nobody can tell you what you've done right and what you've done wrong and what I think you meant. Do what you do for an audience of one. The third thing, humility, a perpetual lesson. Do I need to learn more about humility today? Do I kind of have it packaged up and I've purchased the humility seminar and I know what I'm doing? Anybody here need more humility? Isn't it the most difficult thing we deal with? Aren't we prideful in nature? Isn't the nucleus of all sin pride? We need more humility. It is a perpetual lesson. Look at verse 4 and 5. It says, Rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Do you think everybody is watching him? Do you think they're wondering what's next and why is he doing this and should it be him? Should it be us? This is a custom that feet would be washed at a gathering like this but it shouldn't be the one who claims to be the Son of God. Why is he doing this? Peter is filled with indignation as he watches Jesus take on the servant's role and move from disciple to disciple. Peter must have thought, I can't believe he's doing this. This is terrible. This should not be. Are you like me? You've ever gotten indignant over something only to find out you were wrong? I can't believe this. Jesus moves over to Thomas, bows down, starts washing Thomas's feet. No, Thomas, don't do it. Refuse. Don't let Jesus wash your feet. Oh, no, not John, too. John, don't let him do it. John, this is wrong. No, Judas. He even washed Judas' feet. Don't do it, Judas. No, James. No, Matthew, you should know better. Don't let Jesus wash your feet. And suddenly, Jesus is standing in front of Peter. And Peter's, you know, some of those people, that, I'm going to make a statement here, and I'm going to set this thing straight. All right? You're not going to wash my feet, Lord. You will never wash my feet. He meant it. That's what I like about Peter. At least he meant it, right? Jesus, I'm sure, with love and patience and humility said, then you'll have no part with me. Isn't it cool how Peter, how the light bulb would go on? I'll have no part with you. Well, then my hands and my head, too, then. Wash all of me. 
Little did Peter know he already had been washed. He was already clean. He was already in Christ. But folks, to jump ahead a little bit, there's two kinds of cleansing. And as believers, sometimes as we walk along through the dusty roads of life and sin, we get our feet dirty. And we need a little old-fashioned foot washing. Are you like me as I get older? And this is just disgusting. More and more, I say to Karen on a Saturday or a Monday when we have off together, I think I'm just going to wash up. Oh, no. You know, I might have played racquetball that day, and I didn't take a shower there. I think I'm just going to... I'm just going to wash up. It'll be cool. You know, when's the last time I took a whole shower? Yesterday? You know? There's a whole shower. My goodness, that's needed. Right? And sometimes there's a little foot washing. And yeah, sometimes it's okay if we don't stretch it out too far. Right? Some of you look very guilty. Conviction is falling. I won't say from where, but it's the men. <laughs> Amen. Well, Peter is being taught a spiritual lesson as seen in our text, our complete washing, and another perpetual cleansing as we journey through this life and world. It's necessary to have our feet washed, right? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a foot washing? When we have sin in our life and we confess it and we give it to God, it shows surrender and dependence that we look up. It shows identification that we're on the same page with Jesus Christ. Peter was already in Christ. But do you think there was something coming up where he would need a foot washing? There was going to be an arrest. There was going to be a maniac called Peter who was swinging a sword, cutting off ears, and then suddenly with all that conviction going to a campfire and saying, Jesus? Jesus who? No, I don't know him. Three times. And Jesus had already told him. Have you ever had something that you knew the answer, but you went ahead and did it dumb anyway? Just me? Thank you, Don. That's good. I think the things that break our heart the most is when we know better. And we're just reacting emotionally, and we're forgetting what Jesus is teaching in the Word of God. Peter would need his feet to be washed, but wasn't it good to know that he was already in Christ? But he would need a foot washing to have fellowship restored. Isn't it great that he knew that? You know, somebody asked me this morning in adult Bible study about being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and I said, oh yeah, I said, I'm filled all the time. <laughs> and then I looked at him, I think it might have been Mike. I said, I take that back, Mike. I'm not filled all the time. I need to be filled all the time, you know? The Holy Spirit already lives in me, and I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. But multiple times during the day, do you ever sense that you are not presently walking in the Spirit? Has that ever happened? Oh my goodness, I can't believe I thought that, or said that, or responded that way. And you bow your head and you say, fill me with your Spirit, Lord. Help me to do things your way. A foot washing, checking in with the master, you know, to kind of regain our marching orders. The final thing this morning, humility, a spiritual washing. Friends, as I've said to you in the past, God makes us humble. I never wake up and say, you know, I'm on a quest for humility today. Just watch me go. Well, I would have blown it with that statement. I've told many of you the story of a woman in probably the first church I was in 
who told me at least, I don't want to exaggerate or embellish here, but at least five times how humble she was. She said, Pastor, I'm very humble. I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's good to know. She said, no, you don't understand. I am very humble. I said, I really, really hear you. And I understand. No, no, everything I do is with humility. I said, thank you. I understand. And she went on and on and on. And somebody said to me one time, once you know you're humble, you're probably not humble anymore. Why don't I get a T-shirt? I'm humble. It does not work. The people I have met in my life that are humble, they don't even realize they're humble. The people that I met in my life that are loving and forgiving, they don't even think about it. They just are. The people I've met who have character, they just do have character. And if you're somebody who mixes it up with people or, or you hire people for a living, you can tell really quick who is the real deal. And it's not because they say a million things about themselves. My daughter would laugh as I close. She, maybe she wouldn't laugh. She went on an interview. She's a special needs teacher. And she went to an interview, and there were like six to eight people sitting there listening to everything she said. And they were educators. And it was not an easy interview. And my daughter has put together, and if I share this last week, just humor a 64-year-old guy. My daughter, just like a portfolio, she has a briefcase. She has a briefcase. And when they were asking her questions that she didn't really know how to answer, she said, well, let me just show you what I have here in my briefcase. And she'd go for her briefcase, and they'd say, no, that's all right. We don't need to see the briefcase. And she said several times she brought up the briefcase. You need to see my briefcase. It was kind of her crutch. I need to show you my stuff. I need to show you the results. I need to show you the stats. And people who have turned around and they are learning at grade level with people who are not special needs. Let me show you my briefcase. No, we don't need to see your briefcase. We just want to know who you are as we talk to you. And people will know who we are as we are led by the Holy Spirit of God. Peter, we find, is still seeking self-will and a lack of understanding. And here's what so many believers do. He desires to dictate the terms. I have come to find you got to speak the truth in love and you got to listen, right? But Peter wants to dictate the terms concerning this washing. And let me say very quickly, there are a lot of people out there that are practicing religion. They get involved in excessive washing. What's up here? A remembrance of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, the whole gospel, if you will. It's a symbol. The bread does not become the body of Christ. The grape juice does not become the blood. We do not crucify Jesus afresh. Excessive washing in our church. Are you clean? Then you will always be clean. Amen? But sometimes you'll get your feet dirty. That's why we have a time of examination. And that's why the Bible says... Some of you, because of sin, have physical ailments. Some of you have even fallen asleep, which is a term for believers. The judgment is not salvation. The judgment is stuff in this life that we go through if we haven't continued to wash our feet. But we don't need excessive washing to get ourselves in Jesus. That's religion. We have a relationship. I hope I said that okay. We have a relationship. He loved us to the end. 
and thank God if you responded to him. Jesus washed the feet of Jesus. Wow. Hey, folks, why Jesus? Why another series on Jesus? I can't get him out of my mind. I can't sidestep what Jesus did for me. I haven't touched the hem of the garment in 35 plus years concerning how wonderful he is. There is no other. I love saying the name of Jesus. Don't whisper it at work. People are yelling out how they partied. Tell them how you worship God. Tell them how great your Savior is. He's the fairest of 10,000, and I'm not going to do one of those sermons where I give you 40 different titles of Jesus right now. But the ones I like, the fairest of 10,000, the pearl of great price, the prince of peace, the creator and sustainer, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. With heads bowed and eyes closed, it's not even my time to try to play Holy Spirit of God right now and decide what decisions you should make or what you should be thinking. It's between you and God. But maybe God is working in your heart right now. Maybe God took a verse or a statement and he kind of shook things up. Maybe he brought some things where a foot washing is needed. Maybe you're not sure you know Christ as Savior. And a whole bath is in order. You must be born again from above. Whatever it might be, Pastor, by my uplifted hand, please keep me in prayer today. Anybody like that? Thank you, dear lady. Thank you, dear lady. Thank you, brother. Pray for me. This is the stuff that will shake up your home, your neighborhood, your workplace. When you mean business for God, it is written. I want to be a man or a woman of character and forgiveness and humility just because that's the way my Savior is. I want to be like Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Somebody else, pray for me today. God is working on my heart. I see your hand, brother. Thank you, dear lady. Somebody else, pray for me. Thank you, dear lady. I see your hand. Somebody else. Thank you, dear lady. Thank you, brother. God's working in my heart. We can relate. We might have been like Peter at that foot washing. We might have been in shock. We might not have understood. But boy, Jesus let Peter know, you need to let me do this or you have no part in this. Perpetual humility. Thank God for it. Father, help us to draw closer to you through these Christian graces. Father, we don't claim that we have them all under our belt, that we've obtained, that we've sharpened every skill in our Christian arsenal. But Father, we don't want to remain the same. Please help us. Please break us down. We're all different personalities, but you know how to reach us in our uniqueness. Please reach us. Might we be willing? Might we have teachable spirits? Thank you for the hands that have been raised, and even those that weren't raised, folks just listening and being uh, so respectful in their listening. Thank you, Lord God, for all the great, wonderful miracles that you do in our life. Thank you that you got on your knees and washed those gentlemen's feet. We ask it in Christ's name and his precious name. You can look up.